hang out and stuff at this point in time. So, like, it's good. All right. So, um, oh, I got the wrong class pulled up. Sorry. So, mentioned a couple things off the top. Um, I got that next homework assignment up there. Kind of see it's not due for another two weeks, but I would kind of start chipping away at it. Um, even after this week, you'll be able to work through a few of the first few problems, maybe five, six of them. Yeah, actually after today, maybe a few more than that. Um, uh, I also got up, I kind of got those corrections graded. So I put up how many points you earn back. I'll try to hand those back on Monday. Um, so if you have any questions after I hand them back, feel free to reach out, you know, I know that I, I said not to simply write letters and some people still did. So some of you, if you just turned in kind of the, you know, the correct answer is B, you didn't get any points for that, right? I, I said that um, there's some people that decided not to do it. it blows my mind. But for those of you that did it, um, the average of people who did the corrections, um, I think was a 77. Um, you know, people that didn't do the corrections, their grade didn't go up as much. So the overall average is a little bit lower. For those of you who did turn in corrections, um, it boosts your grade significantly. The average on the exam, kind of like about where I want to see it. Um, and really a lot of them that I went through, uh, I, I think you did, you know, the vast majority of you put a really good faith effort in kind of, kind of those corrections. So I really appreciate that. Um, you can see that what like, you know the correction point, the original grade number that you got correct. I might end up just kind of leaving that. Probably don't need to kind of handle that anymore. Um, but these don't count towards your grade yet. So usually I just put whatever the current assignments are in this category because you know we really shouldn't be getting a zero because it's not due yet, right? But those other things I want to leave up there so you can see them. But they're not right. Zero percent of your overall grade. They're not factoring in. Um, the only thing factoring in right now are your homeworks, your online quizzes, and then the exam grade with corrections. Right? Now, so that's two exams to go, which are 18.3% as well. Um, one thing I might do next week is just kind of change this percentage to give you an idea of like, if I do as well as I did in the first exam, like exactly what would my grade be, right? Because we're gonna have two more exams. But for now, I'm just gonna have this weighted as the court according to the syllabus. Um, at some point I might give you kind of one of these look ahead. Like if I do just as well on the, the exam as I did in the first exam, what would my grade look like? Okay. But for now, I just have it. Okay. Questions for me before we kind of jump into the material here today. I think it starts getting a little more interesting. We kind of have a lot build, a lot of building to do, but we've, we've done a lot of it. So today I think we'll get to some interesting conclusions. Uh, I think I also want to make sure, I don't know if I mentioned this on uh, Wednesday, I didn't post a new set of lectures because if we, I was very, uh, um, I put way more uh, up last week than I thought we'd get through. And so kind of whatever that lecture, that lecture seven is, um, I think it'll be like week seven and eight. And so we're kind of going to keep using that same set of lectures. So the, the one that's currently up there, that's the one that I'm using. So they are up there. It's, it, it might not line up with the, the kind of so I think we ended kind of thinking about this idea of, you know, we're talking about marginal cost, average total cost, average variable, or average fixed, right? One thing that I, I wanted to kind of point out, um, I think this helps us think about these costs a little bit more, is let's think about the relationship between marginal costs and I think I think we've got average total or average variable here, right? Yeah, so average total costs. So why do we see this kind of U-shaped average total cost curve? Or we also said, what else is U-shaped? Average variable costs. Right? So why are they using it? Right? So you can kind of think about initially, right, it's increasing and then eventually starts to raise up, right? So we say that the efficient point on our average total cost curve is gonna be at its minimum, right? Where are my per unit costs, my average total cost, where are they lowest? Well, think about that would be kind of the efficient scale. If I can get my costs, right, if I can produce at the quantity such that I've minimized my per unit cost, that's the efficient point. Okay. But why is it kind of increasing in either direction from that point? Okay. So a little bit of insight as to why. And you know, my the zoom thing is kind of in the way here, but we're thinking about the relationship. Um 
we're thinking about the relationship between marginal and average total costs, right? We'll start out kind of thinking about I've got these gains from swapping things. So I'll kind of try to use these numbers to make a little bit more sense here. So I've got bad marker. Graph two just in case. So I'm just going to use what I see in this graph. So look at the different quantities. I've got what? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. At a quantity of one, and I've got my kind of costs are, I think it's right around seven five here. I'm thinking about this is my marginal cost. This orange line is my marginal cost. And then one, sorry, am I looking at the problem? I think it's six because it's in the middle here. So I think this is what I want. So here, 75 at two, 53. It's like it's 25, four back up to 50, five to, I guess, 75. Okay. So I've just got to graph the first five quantities, right? It's this portion of my marginal cost. So what I'll notice is at each one of these quantities, what's my average total cost? So I can't observe what the fixed costs are here, and I don't have this graphed up enough, but we can kind of get an idea, right? It's about 175. So actually here, this is not quite in relationship to what we're, what we're doing, but if I wanted to calculate my fixed cost, if the average total cost of that first unit were 175 and my marginal cost are 75, what would my fixed cost actually be? Maybe it's easier to think about this one. What are my variables? Well, for if I only got one unit and that unit increased cost by 75, that's my only variable cost. I've only got one unit. So here I kind of think about my average variable cost to be 75, which would mean my total fixed cost, or sorry, my average fixed cost would be 100. The only thing is if I've only got one unit, then my average fixed cost of 100 actually represents just my fixed cost, right? 100 over one. So if I look at this first quantity, the marginal cost of that first unit, that's the only variable cost I have up to that point. So if I just take away that from the average total, and the average total is the same as total cost because I've got a quantity of one. I'm spreading my costs out over one unit. Right, so that's all it is. So I know I could figure out my fixed cost of 100. We don't necessarily need this. So I just wanted to kind of relate to what we just did in the last class. So what I do want to try to figure out, you know, that was average total cost. So I got what 175. It's about to be 100. So about this is what 120 this 112 point five this is going to be two hundred and twenty five so two hundred and twenty five divided by two so one hundred five and then I've got here uh, hundred fifty two fifty divided by three I think this should be seventy five right so you don't have to know where I'm going to these numbers. I did this this time I had here, but like if we were to calculate average total cost based on these numbers, this is what it should be, and that should line up to here, right? This is just a little bit over a hundred. This one is kind of right there at seventy five. Okay, I'm just using those points. I was trying to give a quick graph of those numbers. So what ends up happening is that any time when I'm adding a unit, so let's say I'm going from this first to the second unit. If that unit has a marginal cost, right, that is less than my previous average, then what's going to be true about my new average? Okay. It's going to be lower, right? I'm adding a smaller number than what my old average was, so my new average is going to be a little bit lower, right? It would be the, the idea of, like, let's say I had two and four, the average is three. Well, if I add in something that's below three, I add another two. 
Well, now if I actually let me make this even easier, let's say I add uh, one, right? So I get what? Seven divided by three, right? So 2.33. Right? If I add in a small number, it holds the average down, right? If I add it in greater numbers, what, what do you think happens to the average? It goes up, right? Well, notice here, the average went down. My marginal cost is the new number I'm adding in, right? So now when I go from my second to my third unit, my marginal cost is less than my old average. So what happens? My new average is lower. So anytime my marginal cost is below the average, notice my average total cost is getting lower and lower. As soon as my marginal cost is above the average total, well, now my new average is going to be higher. Right? So the fact that we have this gain from specialization initially, right, and that my marginal costs are typically below my fixed costs, that means I'm going to start out with marginal costs that are below the average total. Well, that means I'm adding a smaller number than what my average per unit cost is. So I'm pulling that average per unit cost down. So anytime my marginal cost is below the average total, the average total cost curve is going down. So we kind of see that here. Right? Anytime that marginal cost is below my average total cost curve, the average total cost curve, oops, I want that arrow, that red arrow, right? Is going down. And then as soon as I get to where my marginal cost is above my average total cost curve, well, now my average total cost curve is rising. I'm adding numbers that are greater than the average. It's going to pull that new average up. Um, and then they will cross at the minimum point. Right, so marginal cost will hit average total cost at its minimum point. Some of the documents I don't love. So the idea here is marginal cost will always hit average total cost right at its minimum point. Okay. Anytime marginal cost is below the average total, it's decreasing. Anytime it's marginal cost is above the average total, my average total cost is increasing. So that's kind of where that U shape comes from. Just, just thinking about these, these costs a little bit more. Yeah. Is that the same for average variable cost too? Yes. <clears throat> yep. So if I'm calculating average variable costs, right, you're jumping the gun a little bit, but they're also going to be U shape. And it's the same idea. My marginal costs are my variable costs, right? So my variable costs, as long as the marginal, Cost is below that, it's going to be pulling that average variable cost down. And then as soon as marginal cost is above that, now average variable starts to increase. Yep. Questions for the movement on that? Okay. Um, I've got some other numbers here. You can kind of see this play out. Um, I kind of already went through some numbers before here, but then you can imagine if I've got my variable cost, right? And they're kind of increasing there. Um, my average total cost I can calculate and different quantities. We don't have to do quantity dumps of one. Okay? So notice um, I've got total cost at a quantity of zero. Well, that's 10. Well, that means that's my fixed cost, right? So then when I produce 20 units, my variable cost is five. So five plus 10 is 15 divided by number of units, 20. My average total cost is 0.75. And then go to the next. Quantity jump, well, I had to go up to 35. So now my variable cost is 10. 10 plus the fixed cost is 10. 20 divided by the number of units of the quantity 35 gives me my average total cost. I'm just calculating average total cost here. So once I look at my average total cost, I can see initially they're decreasing and then they start increasing. <laughs> so if I compare that to my marginal cost, which my marginal cost could just be the change in my total cost divided by a change in quantity. Well, here, my change, I kind of kept the numbers nice. So my change in my total cost and my change in my variable cost, right? Because my fixed are always the same. I think we said last class, it doesn't matter. If you calculate marginal costs as the change in total costs over the change in quantity, well, the only changes that we see in total costs are the changes that we see from our variable cost, right? Because the fixed cost never changed. So you can really compute that marginal cost per unit more. Here I've just got variable cost, so I'm computing from that. Well, notice the jump is always five, right? My my additional cost is going from five to ten. 
and the 15, those jumps are five. The change in my variable cost there is always five. But it just so happened to be in this example, the change in my quantity is decreasing, right? So basically, every time I'm spending an additional five dollars, initially, I'm getting 20 more units. But another five dollars, I'm only getting 15. So another five, I'm only getting 10. So this is the idea that I have diminishing returns to my labor. So I'm spending more of my labor, but they're producing less and less. Okay. When I calculate my marginal cost there, I've got changes of five as always in my numerator, and I'm dividing it by the kind of change in quantity. Zero from 20 to 20, 20 to 35, that change in quantity is 16, 35 to 45, change in quantity is 10. <clears throat> that comes from up with those marginal costs, or if you can be partial last time. But if you notice, whenever the marginal cost is below the average, the new average. Right, so if this is this marginal cost was below the average. The new average is lower. The marginal cost is below the old average. The new average is lower. The marginal cost is greater than the old average. The new average is a little bit higher. Right. It's the same kind of idea we had going on with the the other graph. We're going to bring some different numbers to it. And kind of trying to make the point that it's not always a jump in quantity of one. But I might have a little bit more work to do sometimes, which is our change in quantity from the other value. Okay. Questions? All right. So you already alluded to this, I kind of jumped the gun earlier, but same thing applies to variable cost. So we can always draw out a firm's cost structure. As we've got this kind of like Nike looking marginal cost, where initially maybe we'll get some gains from specialization, but then we know it's increasing because they're diminishing returns to labor. As that marginal cost rate is increasing, our average total or average variable initially will be falling. And then this marginal cost curve will hit them at their minimum point. And then at quantities past that point, our average variable and our average total will be increasing. This is going to be, I'm going to start drawing this a lot. I'm just always going to know the cost structures have to have to follow this. And you might say why it's, you can go through, it's basically a mathematical proof, right? Um, if I have increasing marginal costs, it's going to be that my average always initially starts out decreasing until that marginal cost is above the old average. Still not. So, this is our setup, and this allows us to start thinking about some interesting things. Yeah. So we're now going to make a different, or we're going to differentiate between the long and the short run. So in the short run, we said there's things that we can't change, or we have fixed costs. Right? In the long run, we said we have no fixed costs. Right. So in the long run, what ends up being true about average total and average variable cost. What was the difference I'm thinking about writing out this equation in the last class? How could I find my average total costs? You said one way was to just take my average variable plus my average fixed spot. But in the long run, if I can change everything, I can go to a new, I can purchase a new plant, I can move states, right? I can, I can upgrade my machinery. Everything is variable. So, what ends up being true about average total average variable cost? In the long run, fixed costs are zero. So, in the long run, my average total and my average variable are the exact same thing. However, in the short run, Right, there's going to be different. In the short run, there's going to be things I can't change. I'm going to have these fixed costs. Okay. So, in the long run, I think I alluded to this last class, and I'm jumping the gun a little bit here, but so my slides will be a little bit repetitive. But I know that I, I did this last class. In the long run, it's really easy to figure out where the equilibrium quantity is going to be for a firm because the firms. All right, so I'm thinking about this as the quantity that the firm is going to produce. In the long run, they'll have this marginal cost curve, and they'll have this U-shaped average total cost curve, right? Where the marginal cost intersects at its minimum point. 
We said in the long run, how do I determine whether or not it's profitable to stay in this? Um, oh, you know, well, how can I determine where, where profits are? Well, said my marginal revenue is just going to be equilibrium price. I don't have any influence over the price if I'm one of a thousand firms. We haven't gotten monopoly power yet. So um, we're thinking about, well, here's my marginal revenue. I said, I will produce up to the quantity where what is true. So will I produce this first unit? So no. You will produce it, but you won't produce up to that price. You're right. So will I just produce this first unit? Yes. Why? I'm selling this first unit. How much am I going to be receiving? More than cost. Whatever that equilibrium price is. That's way more than what my marginal cost is. Right. So the added revenue, right? Price was my marginal revenue. The added revenue is way greater than the added cost. That's going to be true for every single one of these quantities. So I'll produce up into the point where they're exactly the same. Right. At that point, what we'll say is. Well, the firms are kind of indifferent at that point, right? If I produce that unit, it adds the same cost as revenue. So I'll produce up to that point. I don't know if I'll produce that last one, but I will just assume that we, we will, right? But we'll, when we say we'll produce up to that point, it's because we know we'll never produce past that point, unless we're idiots, right? Because if we produce past that point, what's going to be true? I'm adding more costs than I am revenue. So I'm just eating into my own profits, right? So we know we'll at least produce up to that point. Well, this is where we can start to figure out, is it profitable in the long run for me to be in this industry? So if I look at this, what's my average total cost if I produce at this profit maximizing quantity, right? Well, my average total cost is right here. And I alluded to last class, we could write Here's see, I don't want you to have to look at that on my back. This is the, the thing that I don't want to talk to through. So I'll write it over here and you can see it. So I said profits are total revenue minus total cost. I said I can get a little bit tricky. Total revenue is just price times quantity. Here I got tricky where I said I can actually rewrite this as quantity times average total, right? Because my average total cost. Is just this. These will cancel. So it's just a different way of writing it. But the reason why this is helpful is because I've got a quantity on both of these things now. I can kind of distribute that. And I end up with this equation where my profits are going to be quantity I'm selling multiplied by, you can kind of think about this is on average, how much am I making from each unit? Well, I'm making whatever the price is on every unit. That's the amount of revenue I'm generating. And every unit, excuse me, I have this per unit cost or this average total cost. So the difference between these two is like, if you want to think about it, kind of the average profit I'm making per unit. Well, if I take the average profit make, I'm making per unit times the number of units I'm selling, that's total profit. So we've got this equation right, that tells us what profits are. So here, profits are going to be greater than zero as long as the price is greater than one. Then the average total cost, I can't have negative quantities, right? All right, so I know that it'll be positive as long as that price is above average total cost. If I look at my graph here, at that profit maximizing quantity where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue, what's true about average total cost relative to price? It's below it. So here I would know these are positive profits. Work through one more kind of kind of thing with this idea. So this is the long run. So things are 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 a little bit easier. We'll eventually get to the short run, but I want to go through the long run first. So let's say instead I've got my marginal cost, got my average total cost, and I'm thinking about here. Is the equilibrium price or marginal? Okay, so I've just gotten that from drawing below my average total cost. 
But what we'll end up first need to figure out is where's the equilibrium quantity for this firm? Well, they'll produce this unit because the additional revenue is greater than the additional cost. They'll produce this unit, they'll produce all the way up to this point. That's like the equilibrium quantity for that firm. But at that profit maximizing quantity, it's still maximizing profits. However, at that quantity, what's true about average total costs relative to my equilibrium price or my marginal price? It's greater, so my profits here would be negative, right? So even though I'm maximizing profits, they're still negative, right? If I produced over here, they'd still be negative, they'd just be a larger negative value. So I am maximizing profits, it's just that even at their max, I still have negative profits. So I'm really jumping the gun here. I won't talk about the implications of this, but if I'm a firm and this is the situation I'm facing, what would I probably do? I get the hell out of that market, right? <laughs> like, I, I don't want to keep like hemorrhaging unless I expect maybe what to happen to the equilibrium price. For it to go up, right? So, but that's only in the short run, right? That's the, the thinking in the short run, like maybe I'll hold out for the future. The long run is thinking about over this long period of time where everything is in flux, I've changed everything I possibly can. All the market conditions have changed, and I'm still earning negative profits. I'm going to get the hell out of it. Somebody else. Yeah. Well, what is like a real life situation be for that? Is it like a startup that where you have negative profits? Yeah. In the long run, so this is really jumping the gun, but in the long run, basically, um, I mean, it becomes kind of a philosophical conceptual question: like, are we ever in the long run? Like, again, ever having there's always things that are our luck say we've got it future. <laughs> um, so in practice, it becomes a little bit more likely to see negative profits. If we were truly in the long run, and this is probably not going to be until next week, what we end up seeing happening is that economic profits are zero. I see these are all things about economic profits where back to the news opportunity cost as well. And so there's like firms will never want to leave and enter the industries. They'll just be perfectly happy with that. Do we ever see that play out? No, we also have things like market power, which this does not, this just assumes I'm taking the prices given. So that's going to be some stuff down the road that'll over and out. It'll, it's not over, okay, but complicated or something. But if you're thinking about this right, like, where I'm going to see from our negative profits? The answer is in the short run. So the long run is a little bit easier to think about now that we know this relationship between price, average, total cost, and profits. But in the so in the long run, we can change everything. Um, I've already kind of went through this. Uh, you know, this is a little bit. Um, I'm going to come back to this because we're having a good discussion. This is a little bit unrelated, so we can we can always return to this in the We'll talk about the economies of scale. I've got a great name for it in the next class uh, or at the end of the class. We get to it out there. So. I just mentioned we're assuming that we're these firms have to take the price again, right? So we're going to call this realm perfect competition. We've got a ton of firms, right? They're all producing the same part. We've got a ton of buyers, right? So no one firm or one buyer has any influence over the price of the good. We just have to take that equilibrium price as given. Right? We've got some other models which we're not going to focus on probably for a little bit. But monopolistic competition, oligopolies, monopolies are all situations in which we have some market power. There aren't near as many firms, right? So in the idea of an oligopoly, we still have a ton of buyers, but there's only like two or three firms. So each firm has a little bit of market power. In the extreme case of monopoly, there's only one person selling this good. And so if you want to buy it, you've got to buy from there. That kind of gives them some leverage against you. And we'll see how that kind of changes the result. But for now, we're going to live in this perfectly competitive world. Okay? Um, if we're arranging these, probably perfect competition is like where surplus is maximum. When we're talking about like total surplus, perfectly competitive markets, total surplus in that market is maximized. And then as we get these higher levels of market power, monopolistically competitive, oligopolies, and monopolies, we start to see total surplus go down more and more. So monopolies, you can imagine there's probably a lot of what? If total surplus is decreasing, we would have a lot of 
increasingly so. Said with loss. I right? remember we were talking about that. We're just losing total surplus from perfectly competitive market. So, um, some characteristics we need to make sure that we have the situation where we're taking the price of dividend. No barriers to entry. So, firms can enter and exit this market as they please. Um, we've got a lot of firms. So, we're buying the same thing. Like I'm one out of a thousand firms, something like that. We've got a lot of different buyers. And we're going to assume for now that they're selling the exact same product, a homogenous product. Right? So, homogenous meaning exactly the same. We don't necessarily need to be exactly the same. We just need it to be like really close substitutes, right? So you can think about like gasoline. That's maybe someone buys a fuel car and maybe there's a loyalty to, I don't know, Speedway versus Shell, or maybe someone has loyalty to, to Pepsi versus uh, Coke. But for the, for the most part, they're pretty perfect substitutes. If it helps to think about a truly kind of homogenous product, this is where I would say like bottled water, like 24 packs of bottled water. There's, there's just no difference, right? If you look at the price, they just, very little difference in those prices, unless you're trying to buy like an upscale artisan one. But I'm thinking about, you know, kind of purified drinking water. Um, you can think about that's a perfectly competitive market. And then because of all these things, firms and consumers or firms and buyers are just taking the price too. So um, and I'll come back to this. I don't want to waste time with this. Um, <laughs> this is really what I want to get to. Because this is the stuff we're having, and I thought we had to so we've got this equilibrium price from the market. Right? <laughs> thousands of firms, thousands of buyers. We've got our overall market supply and our overall market demand curve. Right? This is like kind of where before we talked about I'll add up every individual's demand curve, the overall demand. I'll add up every single producer or every single firm's supply curve in my market supply. The result of that would be some equilibrium price. Firms now have to take that equilibrium price as given. So this becomes, do I have, yeah, there it is. This becomes their marginal revenue. Okay. Jump the so we now have the firm's marginal revenue. Um, we can go through and actually prove to ourselves that the point where profits are maximized are going to be this point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So I kind of got a, a nice little easy quantity jumps of one. Look at our total revenue here, it's price times quantity. The price was 18, so notice that I'm selling one unit. Total revenue is 18, if I'm selling two units, two times 18 is 36, three units, three times 18 is 34. That's how I was coming up with those total revenue values. The total costs, I'm just giving you the costs of wherever this firm was, and so they follow all the rules we were talking about before where marginal costs were, were increasing, right? Maybe initially decreasing, but then eventually we get these law of diminishing returns and we see the marginal cost. So here's our total cost, here's our total revenue. I want to find profit. If I've got these values, it's just the total revenue I've made minus the total cost. So I'll compute this for every quantity. You know, initially I'm selling nothing. I've got some fixed costs here. So what are my fixed costs? 14. 14 right? If I'm producing nothing, I have zero variable cost. My only costs are going to be fixed. Now, as I kind of increase my production or increase the quantity, I'll see my total cost rising. So the next unit, 18 minus 30, profit is negative 12. So you can kind of see, oh, as I start producing that first unit, I've gained some profit, right? The marginal revenue of 18 was greater than that marginal cost of what? 16 going from 14 to 30. Now, if we kind of continue to calculate these um, profit values from total revenue to total cost, You'll see, like initially, that they're increasing. Then they get to a point, past that point, we produce more. We're just decreasing profit, right? going from 18 to 16 to 10. So if I was looking at something like this, what quantity would I choose? Well, where's the highest profit value? That's the quantity I want to produce, right? So it's pretty easy to see when we get our total revenue and total cost. Okay. Um, now, kind of becomes a little bit easier here to think about um, the reason why. Like, you know, the breakdown for the revenue for the cost was to just this kind of simple difference between price and average total cost is because that price was marginal revenue and I had to take that price as given. Okay. So, this is just a different way of thinking about it. You could be total revenue minus total cost, and we're wanting to choose that quantity where profits are highest. So, um, I already, I've already talked about marginal revenue, I've already talked about this optimal rule. Um, if you want to kind of think about the optimal rule, 
that equilibrium quantity that firms will choose is always going to be the quantity where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. This is what we've been saying. And this is just saying how it works. So firms that are in perfect, perfectly competitive markets, uh, we break down, define that as long as the additional revenue is greater than the additional cost, profits are positive. If the additional revenue is less than the additional cost, profits are negative. What are the additional revenues? Price, what are the additional costs? Average total cost. If we this is just kind of lining up with like, like I said, I jumped the gun earlier, but, but this is this is what this is saying. So um let's go. I want to get to the short run here. So what do I have here? Price taking producer, price taking consumer. So these are just going to be some some definitions that we'll use. Um basically just producers and consumers that have no influence over the price. Um we could have market looking at both of these things. So what that's going to look like finally. I already mentioned all this. So this is another way of thinking. So I showed you through total revenues and through total costs that the quantity will choose and where profits are higher. Well, here I'm going to show it to you. We calculate our profits from total revenue and total cost. But I'm going to show you the marginal revenue and marginal cost as well, so that you can see, oh yeah, where profits are highest, where that difference between total revenue and total cost are greatest is also the point. Where price will be um, exactly the same marginal cost, where marginal revenue will be exactly the same marginal cost. So, sure enough, as I produce more of this good, I'll take my total cost minus my total revenues, that'll give me my profits. I can kind of see here initially profits are increasing. If I'm just looking at the profits, what quantity would I want to choose to produce here? Three, right? Four is the highest profit value. So what should be true is that at that 23, the marginal revenue is the same as the marginal cost. Oh, well, it's not quite the same, right? So if I'm looking here, marginal cost is a little bit below marginal revenue. So I use this to make a point, right? When we draw this out, it's nice and continuous, right? I got this nice continuous distribution. What can happen, right, because I have to sell one unit, two units, three units, right? I have these integer jumps. It is a scenario like the following. So here we've got a graph, these qualities on the graph, which I'll show you why. So my marginal costs are what? Three, five, three, five, eight. And what was the last game? Oh, wait, no, not 10. 11 and 13. So I'm kind of thinking about here's my marginal cost values. The problem is I can't sell half of these, right? So I've got this weird discrete kind of jump going on. So I want to think about it as this is like my marginal cost curve. My marginal revenue is just whatever the equilibrium price is. Here, it appears as though that is $10, right? So I just got this nice horizontal line. Well, you can see I will produce up to the point where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. So for this first unit, the marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. Second unit, marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. Third unit, yeah. So I'll produce all three of those. Well, they intersect each other kind of in between these integers. So will I produce that fourth unit? Well, now that marginal cost is greater than my marginal revenue. So that equilibrium quantity is still three. Right? The same way as if we just look at the profit value and pick the highest one. So I just use this to make a point that sometimes you'll have to make this decision where like, what's the equilibrium quantity? Marginal cost may not be exactly equal to marginal revenue, but what will be the, the case is that that last quantity you produce the marginal revenue will be greater than marginal cost, right? Or sorry, it'll be greater than four to three, right? So it may be equal to, or it may just be that that last quantity, that was the last quantity where marginal revenue would be greater than marginal cost. More often than not, I try to give you nice examples where they're exactly equal to each other, so it makes it a little bit easier to like that five. But I know that there's a couple questions that are more like that. So here's all my cost curves. I'm now back in the short run. I'll probably start this if you're paying attention. It should be an easy one. So, 
All right. So if this is my cost structure, and I get it's a little bit hard to see the, the grid lines here. But what if the optimal price is four hundred and fifty dollars? Right. So all right, what if the market price is four hundred and fifty dollars? What would the optimal point or the optimal quantity? Be? Well, I don't have these labels. Label, but try to label. What do you think the red line? What would cost would that be? It would cost about there. Might help. So we've got average total, average variable, average fixed, and marginal cost. Got four lines here. Which one would be the red line? Average. average fixed, right? Because that was where they never change. The fixed cost never changed. It's just that as we produce more, we're spreading those costs cost across more units, right? So they're always decreasing. We then have Kind of this black and green line, we'll notice they're being intersected at what looks to be their minimum point. So if this blue line is intersecting them at the minimum point, what is the blue line? Marginal costs. <clears throat> and then between the black and the green line, we've only got average total, average variable left. Which one's average total? Average so the one at the top, right? Average total always has to be greater than average variable because it includes average variable plus the fixed cost. In the long run, they're the same, but in the short run, we're gonna have these fixed costs. So then the green is the average variable cost? So then green will be average variable. Yep. Questions on the that for the here? I don't know. Yeah, so the market price is 450. What should be our basic Yeah, what should be the equilibrium quantity for this firm? And I shouldn't say equilibrium, but the optimal quantity for this firm to produce. Wherever the marginal cost, up to the point where the marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. Right, we said that's kind of our optimal quantity decision is the quantity where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So what is my marginal revenue? We said that was simply whatever the price is. I, I'm, we're in a perfectly competitive world. I have to take the price as given. So the market price is 450. When I go to sell this good, that's how much I can sell it for. That's the additional revenue I'll earn for every single unit I sell. So my marginal revenue is the equilibrium price of the good. So if I was drawing marginal revenue here, it would just be this straight line across at $450. So I would then go, okay, where does that price hit my marginal cost curve, right? When my price or my marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, that's my equilibrium quantity. So I look here, 450, kind of hard to see if you go over. Okay, it hits the marginal cost right there. Uh, right at that quantity, which is between 300 and 400. Okay. So hopefully everybody got an answer in. I can probably point to it. We kind of walked through it. Hopefully everyone gets this correct. So everyone should make, everyone make sure you get an answer or a response in. Okay. All right, I'm going to close it out. We got 35 of us. All right. So hopefully, okay, well, <laughs> close. We're getting there. We'll, we'll get it one of these days. We'll get it one of these days. All right. So, seven. So, I, I, I want to get to something before the week. Okay. I'll rearrange these slides a little bit and then kind of repost them as a completed version. We'll kind of, the ones we skipped, we'll kind of start with next week. So, we've already talked about, let's skip ahead here. We already kind of talked about this idea that if that marginal revenue or the price is above average total cost, you have positive profit. If it was below, we have negative. If we end up in this scenario where the price is exactly equal to average total cost, we'll call this our great even price, right? Because we know at that point, profit should be equal to what? If that equilibrium price is the same as average total cost, Profit will be what? Zero. So that's my break even price. If the market price goes above that, well, now my equilibrium quantity is going to be somewhere up here. 
where the price is above average total. If price is above average total, positive profit. So if the price goes above this, I get positive profits. If the price goes below this, well, now my equilibrium quantity starts to be somewhere down here. Now, these equilibrium prices below my average total cost, I'll be earning negative profits. So the point at which that price is exactly equal to the minimum point of my average total cost curve, that's my break-even point. Uh, break even point. Okay. So, we have positive profits, that price is above my average total cost. Okay. How can I calculate what those profits are? Well, if I have this formula in front of me, I can just plug things in. But visually, I can also think about this as I'm really just finding the area of a rectangle. Okay. So, kind of draw what we have over there. Average total, marginal revenue, what my price, right? So, here was the optimal quantity. I can kind of see from there. Here's my average total cost. Here is the equilibrium price. So this area here represented positive profit. Why is it that area? Well, because we said we could break down that profit equation to be equal to this. It's just the quantity that the firm chooses, that optimal quantity, multiplied by the difference between price and average total cost. So the difference between price and average total cost would be kind of like the height of this rectangle. The width of this rectangle, which is going from zero out to whatever the equilibrium quantity is. So, the equilibrium quantity times the difference between price and average total cost will give us the value of our problems. So, from here, it's a matter of plugging our numbers in, right? We got 18 price, my average total cost at that quantity of five is what? 14.4. So, my total profits will just be at Optimal quantity of five times the difference between price and average total cost. All right, so do I have that value up here? Yeah, right. I end up getting exactly eighteen dollars. Yeah. How is it on the five and not four? Is four is where we say and five is where? So four would represent the quantity where what? Let's yeah, we'll, we'll be careful saying going. It's going to be my breaking the price, right? And that should be where profits are equal to zero. So in the long run, we'll get to that point. But in the short run, we may see some firms experience positive profits. So I'll talk about next week why, if we have positive profits in this industry, well, then why over time do we see profits get driven back down? We'll also talk about, yeah, we can see positive profits, but if we see negative profits, why might we still stay in this? Okay. Well, we're sure getting to that on Monday. I uh, hope we've got a pretty good day set up for all this stuff. Um, start shipping away that homework. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. See you guys on Monday. Have a fun and safe weekend.